everyone know all in all? Okay, I'm just gonna pretend like everyone knows all in all. <laughs> One, two, ready. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. One, two, ready, and how lovely it is to get together in love. Our Lord teaches us when to meet in my name together. I'll always be in between the gather. O oh Lord, come now and join us here. We ask you to come and give us cheer. Fill us with joy from your Holy Spirit. And peace no riches can provide. O oh Lord, come now and join us here. We ask you to come and give us cheer. Fill us with joy from your Holy Spirit. And peace no riches can provide. The Lord is here always with us. How lovely he is, how content we are. We talk to him and he always listens. He'll always be with us in us. Oh Lord, come now and join us here. We ask you to come and give us cheer. Fill us with joy from your Holy Spirit. And peace no riches can provide. O oh Lord, come now and join us here. 
We ask you to come and give us cheer. Fill us with joy from your Holy Spirit. And peace no riches can provide. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. And you be the finger of <laughs> So God willing, today we're supposed to talk about a topic that, in my opinion, has been talked about way too often. But we're going to go ahead and have this discussion anyways. But before, I need to make a few disclaimers, a few things that we absolutely have to understand. Okay? I am making the assumption that I am speaking to a mature group of people. Okay? Which means that let's not ask questions for the sake of trying to describe an extreme example. When somebody asks questions in regards to trying to be the exception, let me be the first to tell you, however, you are never the exception. You fit into the majority of people who fall into sin. You are not the 1% who can come close to fire and will not get burnt. So for the sake of our conversation today, let's not ask questions about how I can be the 1% of people who walks right up to a flaming furnace and somehow I don't feel any heat. Okay? Let's have a very mature discussion about how to avoid stepping towards the fire. Alas? Another thing. Today we will not be talking about whether or not dating is acceptable or not acceptable. Let me explain something to you. The normal, the normal way that people get married is that they first have to date. And once they date, and they come to the fathers, the priests, and tell them, bless us so we can get married, they eventually get married. People don't start dating after they get married. Dating is a normal way for us to get to know people after we have already decided that we want to get married. So first things first, we are not talking to a younger high school group here, who we have to be worried about what we say and how we say it for the sake of making sure that they don't misunderstand what we're saying. Every single one of you, if you intend on getting married, you will eventually have to date. So people who tell you that dating is wrong, they have no idea what they are talking about. Okay? Dating is a must if you want to get married. But I will tell you this. Part of the disclaimer is that I don't believe in saying that anything is right or that anything is wrong. What I do believe in is explaining to every person that dating is dangerous. Let me give you a very basic example of this. If I were to teach my children, some of you know my children, if I were to teach my children that knives are bad, and then they see me holding a knife in the kitchen, and they see me using the knife, then Baba becomes a what? A hypocrite, right? You told me that the knife was bad, and now you are using it. It is not up to me to tell you that dating is right or wrong. It is up to me to tell you that dating is dangerous. The same way that I teach my children that knives are dangerous. A knife in my hand cooks a meal. A knife in their hand, Allah ya'lam what they would do with a knife if they had a knife in their hand. The same way where I will tell you that a knife is dangerous, I will tell you that relationships are dangerous. If you have no idea what you're doing, and you have no idea why you're doing it, it is the equivalent of giving my four-year-old a knife. So I will not tell you that dating is right or wrong. I will tell you that dating is dangerous. Today we will not go into specifics as to what is acceptable or not is exempt. Abuna, can I hold her hand? Yeah, Habibi, hold her hand. Abuna, can I place my arm around her? Habibi, I'm at the end of the day. Are you doing it in the presence of Christ, yes or no? My point today is not to start answering questions about what's acceptable and not acceptable. Those questions can only, answer, can only be answered by you in a very truthful conversation between you and your spiritual father. Taban, you're going to tell me, what does my spiritual father have to do with anything? Well, let me explain it to you. If I, as a spiritual father, know you inside out and know everything that you have done from a young age and what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and where you need to be able to hold on to Christ, if you came up to me and I know that you have a history of having a problem with lust, and you tell me, Abuna, what's the big deal if I kiss her? 
I'll tell you, you're, you're absolutely out of your mind. You're out of your mind. The idea is not to classify things right or wrong. The idea is to know yourself. So for the sake of making that disclaimer, we can now begin our conversation. Click. Scroll. Let me ask you guys a question. What do you believe is a recipe for a successful relationship? Answer quickly so we can move on. Yalla. What is a recipe for a successful relationship? Today we're supposed to talk about relationships, right? Sorry? <laughs> Starfish. Uh, my wife thought this picture was cute. <laughs> so I put the picture. What is a recipe for success when it comes to relationships? Yalla. Seeing as how you broke the ice, why don't you go ahead? Honesty. Very good. Trust. What else? Yes. Communication. Anything else? Sorry? Love, it would be nice, Yanni. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Christ. Anything else? Compromise. Explain that one. Uh, well, sometimes you have to make an eye on some things, so you kind of have to meet in the middle. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Sacrifice. Very interesting. Some people would say that it's a synonym for Christ. We'll talk about that. Sorry? Patience. Anything else? Sorry? Forgiving. Forgiving so you're assuming that the person in front of you is going to hurt you. It's going to happen? Guaranteed? 100%? Who disagrees? Who here believes that the person I choose to be in a relationship with should never hurt me? Sorry? It will happen. Very good. Even the intentional part we can probably have a discussion about. Next, please. I want to tell you guys the two answers that are often absolutely ignored when we ask for the recipe are purity and chastity. Nobody thinks of those things. When in reality, the most important relationship that you will ever have as an Orthodox Christian is your relationship with Christ. And two of the most important ingredients in that relationship is purity and chastity. I put something up there that's extremely important for us to understand. And this is not so I can get like Facebook likes from all the girls, okay? I want us to understand what it says. It says, a real woman can do it all by herself, but a real man wouldn't let her. When two people come together and they say that they want to be in a relationship, like I really hope we don't have to have this discussion, but everybody does understand that a way that a guy is wired is very differently from a way that a woman is wired, right? Everybody also understands that the way that a guy feels emotional attraction is very different from the way that a woman feels emotional attraction. You guys have ever heard of the five love languages? Right? Never? So what are the five love languages? Who knows them? Sorry? French? <laughs> you, you missed. <laughs> the second one is Spanish. No. No, 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 not actual languages. So let me explain to you guys what the five love languages are, and this is extremely important. If ever you guys get into a very serious relationship, you absolutely need to know what your partner in the front of you, what are his or her love languages. So the love languages are physical touch, okay? You get what I mean? You kind of missed it there, okay? <laughs> physical touch, quality time, gifts, uh, acts of service, and... Do you remember? I just completely forgot the fifth one. Pardon me? Words of affirmation. Very good. Words of affirmation are also known as words of appreciation. Okay? Those are the five types of love languages. What is the number one love languages for most men? Physical touch. Physical touch. Okay? Now, immediately, a whole bunch of people kind of went, hmm, no. Don't do that. Don't immediately go to that, like, X-rated place in your mind, okay? A man will often feel that he is loved when he is capable of putting his arm around somebody. When he is capable 
of demonstrating some sort of protectiveness by holding a girl's hand. A man will feel loved when he can kiss the girl in front of him on her forehead. Those are all ways that a man will feel loved. Women, on the other hand, what is the number one way that they feel loved? Statistically, quality time and words of affirmation. Quality time and words of affirmation. For men, because their love language is not words of affirmation, they don't feel the need to constantly remind you that they love you. Whereas the woman, she needs it. She wants to hear it. And she wants you to show it by giving her quality time. Whereas the guy, it's like, it doesn't matter if I don't see you for weeks. But when I do see you, I want to know that you're mine. And this causes a tremendous amount of conflict. Why did I put this up on the screen? Because within relationships, oftentimes, what will happen is that you will have the girl who will say, no, I want to live this life of purity and chastity. And she has, most of the time, no problem setting her boundaries. The guy has a very difficult time. So what will happen? A real woman can do it all by herself. She can be that girl who constantly tells the guy, take a step back. But a real man does not let her do it by herself. Let me explain something to you. The discussion that I want to have with you today is that if you hold on to Christ, if you hold on to this notion of truly making yourself into an orthodox youth who is pure and chaste, your relationships will succeed. And this can only happen if we truly understand the meaning of those two words. Let's discuss them for a second. Please go ahead. If I were to ask you what purity is, every single one of us would give us this idea of being without sin. The Holy Virgin Mary was pure. We would talk about all these different saints. We would talk about little children, how they are pure. Let's forget all of those spiritual definitions. Let's go ahead and ask the dictionary. What does the dictionary say? It says, freedom from adulteration and contamination. It's funny how the word adulteration is mentioned here. What do we call the sin of fornication? or the sin of sex before marriage, or the sin of any sort of impurity, adultery. And here, purity, when you are dealing in the realm of geology, for you to have pure gold, for instance, in the front of you, it is freedom from adulteration and contamination. What is adulteration now, if you actually look at the definition? It is to corrupt, debase, or make impure by the addition of a foreign or infure, inferior substance. You see, when God created you in His image, He made you into something perfectly pure. You were perfectly created in God's image. You become adulterated and impure when you allow something outside of your nature, outside of the image of Christ, to come into you, and you now become a foreign substance in front of God. How many of you would walk into a restaurant that you're going to be paying $35, $40, $50 for your plate. It is a good, high-quality, high-end restaurant. And they come and serve you your meal, and there's this nasty-looking hair right on top of your soup. How many of you would say, Man, nah, not a big deal. Yalla, deal, ubaa, khalas. How many of you would do that? You're paying 50 bucks for your meal. I would be the first to raise my hand and tell this dude, Habibi, go get me another plate. There is no way I'm eating this. How many of you would accept a cold, a cold cup of water that looks like this with your meal? You see, when Christ calls you and I to be pure, even within our relationships, this is God telling us, I don't accept you like that because I know what you could be. I know what I created you to be. And I will not accept that anything debase you. So what does chastity mean? Oftentimes, chastity is often understood as this whole notion of what? Being a virgin. Let me explain something to you. Chastity has absolutely nothing to do with virginity. There are people who live even after marriage, even though that they held themselves after marriage, and they only had sexual intercourse after they were united to the other person, they can still live a lustful life. We are called to live chastity throughout our entire lives. It has nothing to do with sexual intercourse. You see, chastity is often understood as a sexual behavior that is acceptable or not acceptable within a very specific context. 
What I am telling you is, even within your relationships, and your relationships that extend even after marriage, you are expected to live a chaste and pure life even within that marriage. So I want to erase from your mind immediately that the notion that sexuality is bad before marriage and good after marriage. No. Sexuality can be very bad even after marriage if I do not live it in the presence of Christ. Now, what does this have to do with the conversation we're talking about today? If I were to ask you a question, as a youth who live in today's 21st century, actually don't show it right away, scroll down, even better. If I were to ask you, what are some of the top enemies that you find around you today in society that have ruined the notion of relationships? or that mess you up just enough to make sure that you fail in your relationships? What are some of those enemies? Yes. Social networking, social media. Very good. What else? Yes. Movies, the media in general. Absolutely. What else? That's the only thing that's bothering you guys in society? Sorry? Very good. My social environment. My own network of people who surround me. What else? Pornography is a big one. Music is huge. We act as if music, we only listen to it because we like the beat. If you're the kind of person who listens to music just because you like the beat, let me be the first to tell you in this very church, you're full of a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's absolute garbage. When you fill your head with garbage, that stuff stays in. So when I listen, I'll never forget this. I had this younger youth. She must have been, she must have been 15. And she was singing at the top of her lungs the song that was by, uh, what are those two brothers called? The, the Ying Yang twins? <laughs> From the window to the wall. Okay? So if you don't know this song, good for you. Good for you. Because first of all, you don't even think that these people speak English because of the way that they speak. Okay? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And what these two, and what this young girl at 15 years old was singing, she had no idea of the sexual content that she was singing. She just thought that whatever these guys are talking about, I don't know, something that goes from the window to the wall. <laughs> when I sat down and explained to her, what the meaning of that song meant, she almost broke down and cried. Because she spoke about how she would play that song at full volume in her room in front of her younger sister. See, that's the problem. We have no idea what surrounds us and we act as if it doesn't affect us. But we have enemies that surround us constantly when it comes to the notion of relationships. Pornography, sexual addictions. Music and media, social standards, and even the notion of dating. The notion of dating in society today has become our enemy. To what extent has it become our enemy? Let me explain to you how society views this today. If a boy and a girl see each other constantly and they don't kiss, they don't hold hands, they don't have sex, they don't fondle each other, then they're friends. It's not really a relationship, right? If you've been with her for over a month and she hasn't given herself up to you, move on. Isn't that what society has taught us? Hasn't it? Well, I don't know how far ago you guys were in high school. <laughs> but high school has never been so messed up. Never. You guys have already heard of friends with benefits? Please tell me you've heard of friends with benefits. People who claim to be friends, right? Absolutely no emotional attachments, absolutely no commitments towards each other, but they allow themselves to be able to fall into sin together constantly. Friends with benefits. So when we sit here and say, I hope society hasn't gotten that bad, well, how, how much worse can it possibly be? When we have removed the notion of commitment from the relationship, and we hide behind the standard of what? 
We're just friends. Let me explain something to you. If you were to go back to the 1950s, if Google existed back then, and you typed the word dating, that's what dating looked like. Up there on the top left. A guy who came in shirt and tie and took out a girl who was basically I and she was covered from every, every aspect, يعني, all the way from her ankles all the way to her sleeves. And they shared a milkshake. Today you type dating. the <laughs> struggle, uh, And today, and it's funny because I'm sure that some of us look at this picture over here, and inside them they say, what's, that's actually, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it? You tell me. You see, immediately, we are tempted to say, to what's wrong with kissing? Who said kissing was bad? We are tempted to say, to what's the big deal? And he's his girlfriend. Who, who really cares if he's touching her hip? Who cares? Let me share some very scary statistics with you. Actually, before I do that, let me ask you a question. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. If we were to ask the question, why do most people begin entering into relationships to begin with? What you will notice is that most of the reasons are actually very selfish. To battle loneliness, to feel loved, because I'm infatuated with the person in front of me. Because there is some sort of physical attraction or that I feel like I need to express myself sexually through lust. And there's some people who simply want to explore and are curious when it comes to their sexuality and they feel that the only way they could do that is within relationships. How do we know all these things? Let's ask, uh, let's ask some people who actually did some research. Interesting statistics that you guys should know about. 46% of all high school age students and 62% of high school seniors have had sexual intercourse. This comes from the Center of Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. 62%. Only 2% of high school relationships end up in marriage. If you were to ask those high school teenagers, is this the person you love? Of course. I love them. We've been together for I don't know how long. We know each other inside out. She's the only person who really understands me. And I convinced myself that this is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And it makes sense. When I'm convinced that this is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, then I might as well give myself to this person. And then I realized that only 2% of high school relationships end up in marriage. And when that relationship breaks up, what usually happens? Those two people hate each other, which leads 67% of women to have sexual regrets. 67% of women look back and say, I wish I never did it. These are some very sad statistics. Why? Because what we don't realize is that relationships were meant to be something that is unbreakable. Relationships were meant to be something where you invest. You know how they say, don't put all your eggs in one basket? Relationships are meant for you to put all of your eggs in that basket. You are supposed to love that person like you have never loved. You are supposed to unite yourself to that person like you have never been united to another. You are supposed to sacrifice for that person and meet Christ through that person. And you have no choice but to give your 100%. And when you give your 100% into something that you have no idea what you're doing and it ends up falling apart, you come out with some really bad scars. You see, relationships aren't bad, but they are extremely dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, then why do it to begin with? In Song of Solomons, in Song of Songs, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. He speaks about this notion of little foxes. 
Who here has already heard of the Titanic? Somebody tell me, how did the Titanic sink? Hit an iceberg, right? Well, guess what? The movie that you guys saw with Leonardo DiCaprio has nothing to do with actually what happened. Yeah, it hit an iceberg. That's not why they sunk. They actually avoided the iceberg, pretty much. If you actually study history, what it will tell you is that they saw the iceberg, and then they started to turn away from it. But the actual iceberg, being as big as it was underneath the water, the bottom of the boat hit the iceberg. And it created a hole in the Titanic. Do you know how big the Titanic was? If you don't know, let me give you a clear example here. You see that little speck, that dot right there? That's a human being compared to the size of the Titanic. That right there is a tanker. This is a full-fledged bus, and this is an Airbus A380. You can fit two and a half planes. It is the equivalent of taking the tallest building in Montreal and lying it down on its belly. That's how big the Titanic was. Do you know how big the hole was that sunk the Titanic? Smaller than the size of your fist. At the very bottom level, where the mechanical room was, a hole smaller than the size of your fist broke because of the impact by hitting or scraping the side of that iceberg. What ends up happening? That little hole let in hundreds and thousands of liters of water. By the time they discovered it, they realized that there was no way to get rid of the water because of the accumulation at the bottom level. And by then, the water continued to flow so much that the Titanic literally started to lift because of the weight of the water, and then eventually, it sank straight in. And Solomon says, catch us the little foxes that spoil the vines. You know what happens in relationships? The most common way that the devil will convince you and me that it's okay to do what you want because it feels right is by telling you, start very, very slowly. Let me give you an example of this. And the example I'm going to give you, I am not hinting in any way as to what's right and what's wrong, but I want you to see how quickly it escalates. At first, I tell myself, well, we're serious, we're of age, I have every intention of marrying her, the very least I can do is hold her hand. So I hold her hand. Well, we are mature, we are of age, we've been together for quite some time now, the very least I can do is throw my arm around her. Well, it happens to be our anniversary and we've been together now for over two years and I want to do really something special. So I kissed her for the first time today. Well, now that we've broken the bond of kissing, there's no point in going back because obviously I know that I'm going to marry her and I know that she loves me and I know that, he, that we are going to love each other forever and she's going to be the mother of my children. So there's nothing wrong with continuing kissing. And kissing turns passionate and you lose control of your hands, and fondling begins. And then after you begin fondling, your body starts to think that you're going to go all the way, and you can't control your mind. And you're surrounded by media that shows you things that you want to experience. And you tell yourself, what? But it's different. In the movies, they don't even know Jesus. They don't even know the church. They don't even know nothing. I know where this is going. And I know that I would never hurt her. And then while your mind is saying no, your body is saying yes. And then you cross a line that you didn't want to cross. You see that little hole sunk the Titanic. And that one limit that you thought would do absolutely nothing would sink your entire relationship. When we come to ask the question, how far is too far? I don't know what your too far is. But you should. You should. And if you don't know, let somebody else tell you what your too far is. Because you are not unbiased. You're the most biased person in the relationship. The number one thing that the devil does amazingly 
is he takes some of God's greatest gifts and he turns them into things that repulse us. One of the greatest gifts that God has ever given humanity is sexuality. It's the notion of being able to love the way that he loved us, to sacrifice ourselves, to unite ourselves to another person. Think about this. We say that the Trinity is three persons in one. And in the sacrament and in the mystery of marriage, we say that two people become one. We share the characteristics of God and grow in His likeness when we take the relationship to the altar. And something mysterious happens there. And the devil has taken something that is supposed to be mysterious and beautiful in God and he has turned it into something absolutely horrific. While this young girl is 100% convinced that it's okay for her to give herself to her boyfriend because she loves him, the entire plot that the devil has is that as soon as you give yourself up to him, he will do everything in his power to break you up. Everything. What does this mean? The problem is that we don't have the right definition of love. When you and I say, but I love her. And when she says, but I love him. What love are you speaking of? Are you speaking of the notion of love that you see in the media? You see this kind of love? Where a vampire likes a human being and they make three movies out of it. And then they, this whole... What's the name of the movie? Twilight. Right? That love can change monsters into something beautiful. And you see this whole thing? No. You need to understand something. The orthodox image of love is this. And I know this seems so brutal, but you got to understand that. When you say, I love her, no one expects you to do this. What the church expects you to do is this. You're going to give yourself for her? You're going to die for her? You're willing to take on all of that for her? If you can't say yes to that, then you're not a man who's ready to be in a relationship. And you as a woman, are you ready to be the church? Are you ready to submit at the feet of the person who died for you? Are you ready to say that I am the bride of Christ before saying that I will be the bride of anyone else? Well, if you're not ready, then you're not ready for a relationship. We don't believe that this is love. This is what we believe love is. John 15 says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay one down's life for his others. If we move on to what the solution is in trying to understand what God has in mind when He speaks to us. You see, in God's eyes, we said what? If we are that cup of water that He ordered, and He receives it, and there is dirt at the bottom of it, what God says is, no, I want it to be pure. I want it to be perfect. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Okay, yeah, but he's talking about saints. He's not talking about you and me. Lift your hand if you think you're a saint. Let me ask that question very differently. Abuna stands in the liturgy. At the end of the liturgy. And he says, the holy for the holies. Who are the holies? Who? If you did not lift up your hand when I asked you if you were a saint, why do you take communion? Abuna says, the holy for the holies. Are you holy, yes or no? You need to understand something. You are not holy because of what you do. You are not holy because you go home at night and every Wednesday night you drip oil. 
you are not holy because you did 150 matanyas a day and you prayed the seven prayers of the Agbayya and you've read the Sinixar 60 times. That is not what makes you holy. What makes you holy is Christ. You are a saint whether you like it or not. Abuna stands there and he says, the holy for the holies. And out of our humility, we cry out and say what? Only one is holy, that is the Father. And only one is holy, that is the Son. Don't we all say that? But Abuna does not refrain from saying the holy for the holies. So here when he says, as is fitting for the saints, he's talking about you and me. St. Maximus the Confessor from the 6th century, says this, Nothing created by God is evil. It is not food that is evil but gluttony. Not the begetting of children but unchastity. Not material things but avarice. Everybody knows what avarice is? Extreme greed. Not esteem but self-esteem. It is not only the misuse of things that is evil. Not the things themselves. Relationships are not evil. The misuse of that relationship could be absolutely detrimental though. So what's the cure? If I am in a relationship and I want to make sure that it stays founded in Christ, how do I make sure that I bring it all the way to the altar? How do I make sure that I achieve a point where it comes to the sacrament? I first have to understand that purity and chastity is not an actual location on a map. What do I mean by this? We keep acting as if purity and chastity is a destination, as if you can reach a point one day where you can say, oh, hold on, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm pure. <laughs> you can never reach that state where you say, I have reached a level of purity and chastity. What you need to understand, it's the journey, not the destination. The what keeps me back on the right track? How do I know whether or not I'm going on the right path? The cure for this notion of a relationship that needs to be introduced to purity and chastity, according to the fathers of the church, is the Eucharist. This is St. Cyril of Alexandria, one of the heroes of Orthodoxy. He says, if the poison of pride is swelling up in you, turn to the Eucharist. And that bread, which is your God humbling, which is your God humbling and disguising himself, will teach you humility. If the fever of selfish greed rages in you, Feed on this bread. If you will learn generosity, if the cold in you, if the cold wind of coveting withers you, hasten to the bread of angels, and charity will come to blossom in your heart. If you feel the itch of intemperance, nourish yourself with the flesh and the body and the flesh and the blood of Christ, who practiced heroic self-control during his earthly life, and you will become temperate. If you are lazy and sluggish about spiritual things, strengthen yourself with this heavenly food and you will grow fervent. Lastly, if you feel scorched by the fever of impurity, go to the banquet of angels and that spotless flesh of Christ will make you pure and chaste. We have been told very often, <laughs> How many people have heard this? Let me explain something to you. That sentence is very true. But the way that you and I understand the notion of mishgehizdi is very wrong. The person who says, when I repent, I will take communion, that's like saying, when I am healed, I will take the medication. If you have come to the realization that you need the Eucharist, then come and take it. But when you have reached a point where the Eucharist means nothing to you, and you don't even see the Eucharist as the body and blood of Christ, or you don't even see the Eucharist as spiritual medicine, then be careful. Be careful because you do not want to take God for a ride. But if you need repentance and in you need to become pure again after you have defiled yourself and you need your relationship to work you cannot do it without the Eucharist 
And if for any reason you have a doubt that maybe you shouldn't take communion, run to your father, the priest. And whatever he says, that you do. And I guarantee you, unless you have taken God for granted, you will not be told to not take the Eucharist. If we continue on the notion of the Eucharist, St. Philip of Mary says something absolutely beautiful. He says, chastity is impossible without the Eucharist. Chastity is impossible without the Eucharist. If you are in a relationship and you actually love the person that you are with in that relationship, you encourage them to take the Eucharist every chance they get. And you yourself run to that altar. And you tell Christ, I need you. If you come to the Eucharist, you will give yourself strength that you had no idea you had. Because like St. Philip says, without it, chastity is simply impossible. We end with this. In Galatians 5, it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The last thing that I want to touch on, anybody who has ever been in a relationship and has a past that includes sin that has to do with impurity, whether it be pornography or enjoying to watch, I, it doesn't even have to be pornography. We had this one girl, God bless her heart, she used to watch Prison Break. You guys remember this? Do you remember the series called Prison Break? There was like a sideline, a story between a guy and a girl. And she was absolutely infatuated with that storyline. She really, really wanted to see them get together. You know when you watch a movie and you live out the role of the character? You know? And when something bad happens to the character, you're sitting and you're watching and you're getting upset because something's bad is happening to them? And when something great is happening, you're smiling and you're blushing and you're like, as if everything is happening to you. Well, this girl would watch Prison Break and she would live out the character of the girl. So when she entered into a relationship, it affected her. So how do you deal with these thoughts once you enter into a relationship? Let me share with you this one last story. And then we'll call it a night. This comes from the stories of the Desert Fathers. A brother asked one of the fathers, What shall I do? My thoughts are always turned to lust without allowing me an hour's respite. And my soul is tormented by it. So he said to him, Every time the demon suggests these thoughts to you, do not argue with them. For the activity of demons always is to suggest, and suggestions are not sins, for they cannot compel. But it rests with you to welcome them or not to welcome them. What is he saying here? Let the devil tempt you as much as he wants. The temptation in and of itself is not the sin. It's whether or not you give in to that temptation and you start thinking about that thought, and you kind of enjoy it, or you shut it out. Do you know what the Midianites did they adorned their daughters and presented them to the Israelites. They did not compel anyone. But those who consented sinned with them, while the others were enraged and put them to death. It is the same with your thoughts. The brother answered the old man, What shall I do then? For I am weak and passion overcomes me. He said to him, Watch your thoughts, and every time they begin to say something to you, do not answer them, but rise and pray. Kneel down saying, Son of God, have mercy on me. And then the brother said to him, Look, Abba, I meditate, and there is no compunction in my heart because I do not understand the meaning of the words. Does everybody understand the word compunction? You know that feeling of there's like a, there's like a pinch in your heart because you almost feel bad about something? That's compunction. 
there is no compunction in my heart because I do not understand the meaning of the words that I pray. And the other said to him, be content to meditate. Indeed, I have learned that Abba Biman and many other fathers uttered the following saying, the magician does not understand the meaning of the words which he pronounces, but the wild animal who hears it understands, submits, and bows to it. So it is with us also. Even if we do not understand the meaning of the words we are saying, when the demons hear them, they take flight and go away. You and I, if we want to succeed in our relationships, everything begins here. If I cannot control my thoughts, if I do not give myself to prayer, if I do not return to God and tell Him, Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. My relationship is doomed because I think that my relationship will succeed on how many boxes of flowers, how many boxes of chocolates and how many flowers and how many stuffed bears I buy. That's not what's going to make your relationship grow. What will make your relationship grow is whether or not you have allowed the mystery to take full place in you. Whether or not you can see Christ in that person in front of you. And whether or not you are willing to live out your role as Christ did for the church and as the church did for Christ. Glory be to God now and forever and to the ages of all ages. Amen. Any questions? Well, everybody understood the questions. What are the right reasons for dating? Yeah, the question was, there was a slide that talked about the different reasons for dating and how all of them seem to be wrong reasons to date. So what's being asked right now is, what are some of the right reasons to date? Well, let me explain something. If you, what, what, what do people do when they reverse engineer something? They take something at its perfect state and then they slowly start to break it down to see what steps were taken to actually bring it that, to that process, right? What are the Chinese manufacturers amazing at doing? They buy a finished product and they reverse engineer it, right? They break it down to the point where they can say, I can duplicate this. Let's do that. Where do we begin if we want to see the perfect relationship? That relationship is clearly a married relationship, right? So let's take a look at a successful married relationship. If that is your goal when you date, then that is the only reason that you should date and be in a relationship. Anybody who says, I am beginning a relationship just to see where this goes. And Tabit, do you get in your car and get on the highway and say, I'm just going to drive and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Adventure, adventure. adventure. If you don't have a destination, and that destination is not a successful Christian marriage, then why are you in a relationship? Man, it's normal, but I'm, I'm 23 and I'm growing old. 23, had moot. It's about time. It's about time. It's about time for what? A relationship. How do you see that from a relationship? People say, I am ready for a relationship when they, they haven't even answered some of the most critical questions in life. Do you want to be a father? Do you want to be a mother? Do you know what you want to do for a living? Do you know what kind of person you want to be? But eh, my clock is ticking. What clock, Habibi? <laughs> what clock? My personal belief, and I will not speak on behalf of the entire church, but my personal belief, that if your goal is not a successful Christian marriage, then why are you dating? Next to like, eh, no, 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 we're still waiting. 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 
يعني ايه؟ ما هي لسه هتعرف عليه وهو هيتعرف عليا وهنشوف اللي هيحصل. You don't know enough. You don't know enough. To actually say that this person might be my husband? Man, I am dating to see. What do you mean? What do you mean? If you don't know enough to step into the relationship, then you shouldn't be in it. How am I going to know? Observe. I don't understand. What do you do when you try to find an electrician for your house? What do you do? You just call the first one and say, let him in. If we take more time in trying to pick the person who's going to cater our wedding than the person who's going to marry us at the wedding. Does that answer at all? Yes. Did everyone understand the question? No? The question is, what if I find myself in a situation where I have emotions for another person and that person is not Christian or there is a great distance between them and God? Am I expected to simply suppress my feelings? You'll have to forgive me, but I just spent the last hour speaking to you guys truthfully, so I will not shy away from telling you the truth right now. Nobody cares about your emotions. If this person does not bring you closer to Christ, and this person does not love Christ more than you, what are you doing? This notion of, man, we're getting into a relationship, and hopefully I will change them, Malish. Yes, suppress your emotions. Deal with it. You're going to cry for a month, two months, three months, six months. But it will avoid you a lifetime of disaster. If you do not see Christ in that person, then your relationship is doomed. I had to tell somebody just recently that unless somehow the relationship that they were in was not transformed and it became a Christian one, then as a priest I do not have the right to marry them and I would not marry them. And the person thought that I was a horrible person to say that. You would stop me from getting married? No, I'm not stopping you from getting married. What I am telling you is that I have the responsibility to stand in front of that altar and tell God, these two people know you. And these two people want to be like you in the church. And that's not the case. And I'm not going to lie to God for you. We have to make sure that our relationships are a lot more than just feelings and emotions. A relationship goes way beyond this notion of butterflies and romance. There is nothing romantic when your spouse has a 41 fever and is throwing up and you're picking up after them. There is nothing romantic when all you want to do is smack and strangle that person, but somehow you find it in you to love and be patient. There is nothing romantic when your wife wants to shoot you because she feels the pain of childbirth and she blames you for everything that's happening. But there is something beautiful and divine there has nothing to do with emotions and has everything to do with you becoming Christ and her becoming the church. So yes, get over your emotions because if that person doesn't know Christ, then you shouldn't know them. Everybody resembles Christ. Every single person 
those guys who chopped off the heads of the 21 martyrs of Libya. The image of God is inside them. I wouldn't want one of my daughters to marry them. The idea is not to say I see Christ in them, but they don't know them. That person needs to know Christ. They need to. Look at the most basic situations that you're going to face. Sunday mornings, what do you do? Is my wife going to come with me to church or not? Is she going to be okay when I baptize the child? When I have to come home late, will she read the Bible with the child? Will we stand up and say our father together as a family? Will she understand why I don't want my child to wear a four-inch skirt? You could see them as a good person as much as you want. I am telling you this is the person you will be united to. You have to be able to love Christ more than them. I remember the first time I ever told this to my wife. I turned around to her and I told her, Tina, I love Christ more than you. She looked at me and smiled and she said, good. And somehow my wife felt that if I loved Christ more than her, that means that I could not love her any more than I did right there. If you cannot love Christ more than that person, then you shouldn't be united with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, okay. <laughs> so everybody knows that we're Egyptian. And as Egyptians, we like to talk. And we don't like to talk about ourselves. So we like to talk about everything and everyone else. You have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of that. So what I would tell you is, and again, make sure that you follow the guidance of the spiritual father who is helping the both of you build this relationship. You have nothing to hide. You don't have anything to hide. But at the same time, you do not want to attract problems. Right? When I had children, I didn't hide it. Everybody knew that I had a child. But I wasn't walking around in a mall holding my infant child going, look! He is here. <laughs> so what I am saying is that you have to be careful because oftentimes what will happen is a lot of people are very happy to demonstrate and to publicize the fact that they are in relationships. Don't be those people, right? The person doesn't even know yet that we're in a relationship, but my Facebook status has changed. All of my pictures on Facebook change and everything becomes a selfie with me and her doing duck face. I flaunt the fact that we are in a relationship and every chance I get, I drop the fact that what? We're together. Your relationship has to be about you and them and there is privacy in that. There is privacy in that because your relationship is supposed to be something that is intimate and private. The details of your relationship should only be shared 
with the person who is counseling you spiritually. So if you know for a fact that you would be doing something that will draw negative attention, then avoid it. I'm not telling you to lock yourself up and make sure that no one knows. No. If your spiritual counselor is aware, then it doesn't really matter. Who knows? It doesn't. But just be aware that anything that you do and everything that you show draws attention. And the more attention you have is not always very good for the relationship. Anything else? Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Can I talk about SYC? Can I promote SYC? Um, Abuna just announced something actually that's very, very good news. For those who are paying attention to what's actually happening in Montreal uh, tonight, uh, tonight there is actually an all-church youth tazbeha that's happening in Montreal. And His Grace Bishop Iklamandos just announced to us that, thank God, he will be with us on the eve of Nairu. So September 11th, in the evening, here at St. Mary's, we're going to invite all of the Orthodox youth to be able to come and join us in midnight praise here with His Grace on the eve of Nairu. So the 11th in the evening, there's a whole bunch of celebrations that are happening here in the church. Uh, Father Marcus just informed me that there's going to be a celebration for the graduates and so on and so forth and those who uh, have finished the service and so on and so forth. And right after, there's going to be an all-youth midnight praise with His Grace. So please make sure to come out. As for the Senior Youth Convention, we originally said that we have 120 spots. We blew the 120 spots. They're all gone. They're all gone, okay? We called NAF Canada. And NAF Canada told us, okay, we can give you another 50. 30 of those 50 are gone, okay? This is going to be the first senior youth convention in three years, and we already have a participation of approximately 145 youth guaranteed to be there, okay? His Grace Bishop Clamandos is going to be with us for the first day, and then afterwards we're going to go ahead and continue on without him on Sunday. What you need to understand is this. This is the first time in three years that we resurrect the senior youth convention. It is going to be absolutely phenomenal. The actual way that it's going to roll out this year is going to be great. We have four of the fathers who are going to be speaking to us. If you guys, most of you know them. Father Krillus from Montreal, Father Peter from St. Peter and St. Paul's, Father Gabriel, and Father Victor. All of them are going to be speaking to us during that convention. Not to mention the fact that if you have never seen the facilities at NAF Canada, it is absolutely phenomenal. It's one of the greatest facilities that we have ever used. We completely said that we're never going back there because it's gotten way too expensive and we got a ridiculous deal this year at $115 per youth. So you absolutely have to make sure. If you have not given your name yet, you need to do it immediately because there's only about 20 spots left for the entire diocese. And I'm 100% sure that they're probably going to be blown out relatively quickly. So again, Saturday the 19th of September, Sunday the 20th of September, and it's going to be held in NAF Canada in Cornwall. The theme is going to be on the notion of, of let there not be a hint of impurity. So the, the, the whole subject is going to be on us truly understanding what does it mean for a youth who grows up in this society to remain unspotted from the world? What is, how is that even possible? So we're going to be discussing with the fathers what does it mean to be truly an unspotted Orthodox youth in today's society? It's going to be truly, truly wonderful because the youth, the fathers who are going to be speaking to you there, almost all of them have grown up in this society and you know exactly what it means. So it's going to be really, really wonderful. There's going to be some great discussions. And what's really cool is that this year for the first time, there's going to be several discussions happening at the same time and you get to choose which topic you want to attend. So there's a general opening session for everyone. There's a closing session for everyone. And the two sessions in the middle, you get to choose which father and which theme you want to listen to. Yes.
there is, so in, the, in theory, because it's two days, I think it's like that you guys are going to have to look at that from a church perspective. Yeah. I don't I'm sorry? We accepted bread. We accepted bread. Okay. Accepted bread. Give me a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A good chance that we have Amba Klimandos with us will be tomorrow, and we have Tazbeha tomorrow with him after the Vesper. He will, he will do this, the, the Vesper, and we will do Tazbeha for two hours only. That's it, but with him, a few hours. That's why, please, uh, we have to attend all together. Uh, another announcement for next week. We have announcement, guys, for who's here on the long weekend? Who's available, who will be in Ottawa on the long weekend? Everybody else is not here. So we're actually trying to, to do something together on the long weekend, and Mira has something to say. Yeah, uh, have you heard, guys, of the escape rooms? It's something like a room where you go in and try to solve a mystery and find some clues, and, uh, and in, a, in an hour you try and get out, and then multiple groups are playing, and you see who comes first and who can make it uh, earlier than the rest of the groups. So we're trying to plan this for next Saturday, and after that maybe Mm, weather permitting, either a barbecue or eat somewhere, depending on that. So it's going to be a fun day, and I think Amir will be talking about a topic after that. Yeah, we'll do about the study, and then yeah. we'll come all together to the church because there is the Yeah, yeah the activity will be ar starting around 11. Yeah, uh, I think it, uh, we will be meeting at church, church at around 10.30, around, uh, something like that. The activity will start at around 11 or 11.30. There are multiple rooms, so each room will start at a specific time, all around noon, and we will all be done at around 1.30 1 to go to barbecue or eat somewhere or something like that. More details will follow on Facebook on the group. So details will follow on Facebook. So just uh, stay tuned and look at your Facebook. Okay. So whoever is interested, can you come and tell Mira so she can take names and no numbers? of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you, Lord, for this wonderful gathering. We thank you, Lord, because you constantly keep the gates of this church open to your youth. We thank you, Lord, because you have given us a safe haven where we can come and discuss things, Lord, and open our hearts to you and hear your word. We ask you, dear Lord, a special prayer on behalf of your youth, each one by his name and each one by her name, that you may be able to watch over us, Lord, that you may be able to guide us and guard us and bring us closer to the notion of purity and chastity in you. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you even within the relationship. Help us to realize, Lord, the purpose of our relationship is to be able to grow closer to you. 
help us to be able to realize that a relationship is supposed to, it's supposed to catapult us closer to you, Lord, so that we can be transfigured and ultimately so that we can become more and more like you. The intercessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, St. Mary, St. George and St. Anthony, St. Mark and St. Mary of Egypt, and all the saints, Lord, who have pleased you since the beginning. Please, Lord, accept our prayers and make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. في <laughs> بيتزا